Welcome back, everyone. Um, the next lecture is going to be by Gergen Neu, who works predominantly on online uh, optimization, bandits, and theoretical reinforcement learning. He also has an ERC, which he uses to support a lot of us uh, volunteers in our current research. And give him a warm, warm welcome. All right, cool. So, uh, so this is the part where I should be thanking the organizers for inviting me, but that's kind of awkward in this case because I'm supposed to be part of the organization team, and uh, and it's I always find it sort of sketchy and awkward when uh, organizers invite themselves to give a talk. But I guess in uh, in this case it's uh, it's not a big problem because I didn't do any work with the organization. <laughs> I don't know, maybe just making it worse. Okay, maybe I should stop this monologue right here. But. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I guess uh, all credit goes to uh, Matteo and Vincent for leading, uh, for leading the effort in organizing this school and also for the team of volunteers that includes all of my students and everybody, uh, all the other students in our team. So they're wonderful. Uh, I don't know, maybe this is the right opportunity to thank them a little bit. Huh? I suppose uh, we're going we're gonna to have some other opportunities to thank them again uh, on Wednesday at this uh, mysterious concert that is going to happen. Right, but, uh, but let's talk about reinforcement learning because that's why, that's why you're here, right? And, and that's why we are here. So, uh, so far in all of these lectures at this summer school, uh, I think literally all of them, we've been looking at reinforcement learning methods that were derived from the perspective of dynamic programming, value functions, optimal value functions, Bauman equations, and so on. And, uh, and what I'm going to be doing today is Put this a little bit lower because there's some kind of feedback. Okay. All right. Can you still hear me? Yes. All right. <laughs> I think the further away you put it, the higher the sensitivity. Okay. Maybe your mic is on. That's that's what they call a professional musician. All right. So. Uh, okay. Okay, now it's good. So, uh, so what what I plan to do in this uh, in this uh, lecture is give you a bit of an introduction into an alternative framework uh, for developing reinforcement learning algorithms, an alternative framework for studying sequential decision making and optimal control problems, and this is going to be something that can be a little bit unusual for some of you. So I try to go like a little bit slow, and with not so much focus on the most recent. Uh, and fancy results, but rather on the foundations and the basics, trying to give you some basic understanding of where this framework comes from and how to derive some algorithms from that. All right, so let's see if this kind of uh, funky setup works that I set up for myself here. Right, so this is, a, so this is the rough outline of this, uh, of this talk. I'm first going to be giving you, I suppose, the fastest introduction to Markov decision processes because I have seen this like a million times by this, uh, by this time already. And that's when I'm going to be talking about uh, this uh, funky linear programming framework for Markov decision processes. And I'm going to show you uh, how to derive some algorithms from this. In particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, so-called primal dual methods for solving Markov decision processes. And uh, if there's time at the end, I'm going to show you uh, some relatively recent results uh, that we have developed for linear function approximation in this scenario. But uh, I suppose this material gets like quite a bit technical, so I will, I will basically focus on the first uh, two bits here. All right, okay, so that's uh, our favorite three words together. Uh, Markov decision process, I, I suppose this slide is really just uh, uh, there to fix my notation. So an MDP model is a sequential decision-making problem in which a learning agent observes the state xt of the environment, so importantly I, knew I use xt. Uh, to denote states. This is notation that comes from the optimal control literature. So in each round, we observe the state uh, of the environment, xt. We take an action, at, taking into account this state and all the history that we have seen before. And as a result of this, we are going to obtain a reward that is some function of the state and the action. And the environment is going to give us a new state that is generated according to this Markovian rule, which means that the distribution of the next state is only a function of the current state and the current action and that was taken. And then our goal from the perspective of the agent is to figure out a way of picking uh, our actions, selecting a sequence of actions such that 
some kind of numerical objective that captures long-term rewards is maximized. And uh, the specific setup that I'm going to be focusing on in this, uh, in this talk is this uh, discounted return, which is sort of the most popular one that is studied in the literature and has been most studied here in this summer school as well. So precisely, we're going to be looking at the infinite sum of rewards. I'm writing red on red, so that's very efficient. But, uh, but what we're going to try to optimize is the sum of discounted rewards uh, discounted by this gamma discount factor. I don't think I need to explain that too much. So, uh, so there are some basic facts that have been established several times over the week. Uh, so I'm going to like recap them real quick. You can find all of these facts in well any of these famous books, like the Sutton and Bartow Reinforcement Learning Book, the MB MDP book by um, by Martin Putterman, or the Dynamic Programming books by Dmitry Bertsekas. So uh, since we know that uh, the next state uh, distribution is only a function of the current state and the current action. Uh, uh, and we have a stationarity property as well, which means that the transition function does not depend on time. We know that it is enough to consider stationary policies, which only look at the current state and do, do not remember anything about the history, and then produce a, a, a probability distribution over actions. So we are going to be uh, happy with this, and we're going to be uh, deriving algorithms that produce such stationary, potentially randomized policies. And uh, we're going to be using this to develop uh, our theories. Uh, of course, there are many other beautiful properties that are useful for deriving algorithms. For example, the existence of a deterministic optimal policy, and also, uh, and also a guarantee that uh, an optimal po that there exists an optimal policy that is optimal no matter what starting state distribution we initialize the process from. But in our model, we are going to attach some importance to the initial distribution of states as well. So, right, uh, I think this is, this is something that should be emphasized for the purpose of this talk. Uh, this part right here that says that uh, x0, suppose that's a 0, is drawn from some fixed distribution nu0 at the beginning of the process. And then all consecutive states are generated by the Markov decision process. So in the framework that I'm going to be talk talking about, uh, this is going to have key importance. Uh, for dynamic programming, this is not necessarily so important. But we're going to see that for, for linear programming, this is going to be uh, something uh, curious and nice. All right, so, uh, so pretty much all of the algorithms that we've been looking at uh, during the week uh, are based on, uh, in one way or, or the other, based on the Bauman optimality equations, which is a nonlinear system of equations that characterizes something that is called the optimal action value function that establishes that the optimal action value function equals the immediate reward plus gamma times the optimal value of this, uh, of this action value function in the next state. Right, so, so that uh, the value function decomposes into uh, two bits. And what's nice about this uh, optimal action value function is that it directly encodes a policy. So basically, just by uh, being able to solve this system of equations and being able to find a solution for this uh, system, I immediately find an optimal policy that is going to maximize my long-term rewards. In particular, I know that uh, a greedy policy with respect to this Q star directly encodes uh, uh, an optimal policy. And, uh, as famously shown by Richard Bauman in the 1950s uh, and others at the same time in the context of optimal control and game theory, uh, a solution to this system of equations uh, can be found using a recursive procedure that is called dynamic programming. Right, so we've been looking at all sorts of methods that have been derived from this perspective, including TD methods, uh, including uh, uh, approximate dynamic programming, programming methods like DQNs, uh, Q-learning, and so on. So all sorts of approximate value iteration methods and approximate dynamic programming methods have been developed using this framework as a starting point. Uh, uh, facing the two challenges, uh, the two key challenges of reinforcement learning, which are, which are the fact that uh, the expectation over the next state x prime that uh, that appears in this uh, in this little formula here can typically not be exactly evaluated in real world applications. So we need to figure out a way of replacing this expectation uh, with uh, 
some approximate versions thereof, try to approximate um, the next state distribution in some, uh, in some clever ways. Uh, so this is one of the challenges uh, that you need to face in reinforcement learning. And uh, the other one is, of course, is that if the state space or the action space is very, very large, then there's simply no hope of finding an exact solution for this system. And we need to rely on some approximations as well. So sort of what happens morally in this framework is that we start from a set of equations, right? That is uh, derived from a methodology that is developed for, uh, for a fully known system with fully known transition function and reward function. And then we just uh, work from this as a starting point and use it as uh, an inspiration for deriving algorithms. So we're going to be doing the, uh, the same steps for an interesting alternative framework for sequential decision making. So our goal is to study a sort of alternative theory that is parallel to this uh, dynamic programming view and try to make the same steps to this, right? So we're going to figure out the optimal solution uh, derived from the framework uh, that we're going to develop. This is going to be the linear programming framework. And we're going to use this as sort of a spiritual foundation for developing algorithms that can deal with samples and that can deal with function approximation and large scale uh, state action spaces. All right, so this is uh, the framework of linear programming for Markov decision processes. And it is based on the following little uh, calculation, the following little observation. So uh, the objective that we want to optimize in, uh, in reinforcement learning or in optimal control in MVPs is the following. This is just a discounted sum of rewards uh, for policy pi. We have agreed that it's enough to consider stationary policies. So we are looking for a policy pi that is going to maximize this quantity right here, uh, defined as such. So if I do a little bit of uh, 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 gymnastics on this, uh, on this object, I can rewrite it in a very convenient form that is going to guide us into algorithms. So the first step that I do here is notice that uh, this gamma factor and this sum is not random, right? So I can just swap it outside of the expectation. And I only need to consider the discounted sum of expected rewards under the policy that I'm considering, right? So if I use the definition of what an expectation is, I can rewrite this whole thing as follows. So an expectation is really just the sum of rewards that are weighted by the probability of seeing each state action pair, right? So I just rewrite this expectation as a sum over the state action space, right? So again, reward of the particular state and action weighted by the probability of landing in this state action pair in round t, given that I start from uh, nu zero. So, and then, uh, as any good mathematician, when I see two sums, I swap around the two sums, right? Because that's always what you have to do when you see uh, two of these. So you just sum this, uh, or swap uh, the sum over states and actions and times. And then, uh, and then you cry out that, uh, oh, this looks like uh, some kind of an expectation, right? So this looks like a sum over uh, rewards and a sum over some other object this one right here, that is going to be of some interest for us. So if I do one tiny little step, which was just to, to multiply and divide with one minus gamma, right? which I do for convenience, and you're gonna be understanding in a second why I did this. So if I multiply and divide with one minus gamma, then I can uh, 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 give this object here, colored in red, a special name, right? I'm going to call it the discounted occupancy measure of policy pi. And I did all of this uh, because now I know that this discounted return objective that I'm trying to optimize, R gamma of pi, the discounted uh, total reward of policy pi, can be rewritten in this very convenient linear form, right? So my objective, up to some normalization, can be written as a dot product between this object that I call uh, the, uh, the discounted occupancy measure and the reward function. 
So what this little calculation shows is that uh, this optimal control problem that you're facing has some kind of a hidden linearity property. The reward that you're trying to optimize is linear in an appropriate representation, which is this discounted occupancy measure. So, so what is what is the what is the meaning of this? Oh yeah, there's a question. Uh, yeah. So my question is, wouldn't the expectation also include the uh, initial state distribution? Oh yes, right. So so that expectation also uh, uh, is with respect to the initial state distribution as well, right? So so what what this uh, what this notation e pi means is that uh, <laughs> is there somebody calling me? No, I'm <laughs> well, maybe. It's a bit of a mystery. Right, so, so, so what this notation E pi means is an expectation over the stochastic process in which a state x0 is drawn from the initial state distribution. The actions are taken with respect to policy pi. So, so each action AT is drawn according to the policy pi in question. And the next state is drawn from X T A T and yeah the, the 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 initial state is tricky. Right. And and uh, the choice of the initial state distribution influences what this uh, what this uh, occupancy measure is going to be like at the end of the day. Yes, thank you for that clarification. Right, so uh, so so let me let me give you, give you some more intuition about what this occupancy measure is because I think it's a bit of an unusual concept. So if you if you, if you look at this sum that I sketched here, maybe if you just look at uh, this sum the way that it is written here. So what this what this is uh, essentially counting is the discounted number of times that I visit state action pair x and a if I visit if I follow policy pi. Yes. Um, is this um, also referred to as the successor representation uh, in some kind of like neuroscience literature? It's right. Like, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it, ha it has a lot to do with the successor representation. Uh, let me just uh, finish this thought, and I'm and then I'm going to connect this Thank with you. the successor representation. Indeed. Right. So, uh, so what this uh, what what this object is trying to measure is the discounted number of times that I visit a certain state action pair if I follow policy pi and I start from the initial state distribution and do zero, right? So this is going to tell me uh, uh, how many times I visit a certain state action pair uh, uh, under this process discounted with this gamma t. So earlier visits are going to matter more and later visits are going to matter less and less. And the reason for and the reason for adding this normalization constant one minus gamma in front is to make sure that this uh, is going to give me a probability distribution, right? So this is sort of uh, there to normalize things in a way that uh, we can think of these objects as probability distributions, and it is going to make our lives a little bit easier, this normalization. Right, so, uh, so the connection between this object and uh, what is called successor representation in some areas of neuroscience and also reinforcement learning is that in the successor representation, what you count is the number of times that you visit each state, given that you start from a particular state, right? So it's conditioned on the initial state. And what this is, is essentially an expectation of that under the initial distribution, right? So in, in, in a successor representation, what I would have here is uh, instead, of this, uh, instead of this probability, I would have a probability that is conditioned on x0 being some specific x prime. All right, very good. And, uh, and, then, and, then what is, uh, and, and then what can be said about that, according to this little calculation, is that if I call this object uh, mu pi given x prime, what I can show uh, is that the value function at uh, x prime can be also written as a similar linear form like this, right? 
So this is this is this is very easily seen from the same calculation that I that I wrote here because the only difference between the total discounted return and the value function is the conditioning in the on the initial state. Yeah, and I suppose this is true for the for the normalized value function that is to be absolutely precise. All right, so this is a key object uh, in uh, the area or in the or in the framework that I'm going to uh, develop here. So really what it, oh my God. Is that, is that legit? Is that real? <laughs> really? Okay, maybe I'm going to like uh, switch over to Google Meet. No, I think that this, uh, that this Zoom is bullshit. Uh, All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something more legit. Yeah, the thing is that I, I just really don't know how to use Zoom, so I'm gonna do now. Sorry about the little awkward technical break. I can think about some clever questions, I suppose, in the meantime. I think Google Meet is going to have the same problem, but... Uh, I think uh, this is already what is going to justify the break in the middle. There we go. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. All right. So, uh, so really, uh, the reason that I did all of these gymnastics with the math is to rewrite uh, the is to rewrite the uh, the objective that I have in mind in this nice linear form. All right. I think that's as good as it gets, really. All right. Wonderful. An endless stream of notifications coming up to me. All right. So the reason that I did this is to achieve this nice and linear form, and I hope to be able to exploit this using some uh, some reasonable framework. So if you just think about an example, right? So what I plotted here uh, was the occupancy measures uh, for some pulses in a two-dimensional uh, state space. So these are just some large grid volts, and what I plotted here is the occupancy measures for six different policies. So the first of these policies is sort of trying to go uh, to the lower left. The second of these policies is just uh, hovering around the initial state. The initial state is denoted by this little red dot there. The third of these policies uh, is going uh, in that direction, and so on. So all of these policies are moving into different parts of the state space, and what I, what I am plotting here is just the discounted number of times that uh, they visit each state action pair. So, uh, so if I say that I want to minimize, uh, oh, sorry, maximize this reward function, which is something that gives high rewards here in this uh, lower right part of the state space, then all I need to do is to find the occupancy measure, or rather the policy whose occupancy measure spends most time in that lower right corner of the state space. So which one is that going to be, do you think? Yeah, I think it should be six. Uh, so uh, so this is, of course, like, you know, nice and intuitive, and you can, you know, uh, think about this uh, as, uh, as like a nice little toy to play around with. But the question is, okay, how do we do this in a systematic way, right? How do we do this without having to enumerate all of the policies and having to stare at plots like this? How do we figure out what is uh, an occupancy measure? 
um, that, uh, that uh, has maximal inner product with our reward function. So that's the question that, uh, that, is a, that is a very natural one to ask. And the following observation is going to be very helpful for us. Uh, so, uh, so key property of occupancy measures is that they satisfy the following so-called flow property. It uh, essentially establishes that uh, uh, the state occupancy in any state so notice that if I sum out the actions, then what I get is just the number of times that I, the, num the discounted number of times that I see each state in the trajectory. So this is equal to uh, the, the initial probability that I start from this state, right? So this is the first part of this sum, right? And, uh, and uh, gamma p transpose times uh, mu pi. So let me just resolve this notation for you. So this uh, p transpose mu pi. This is something that turns a state action distribution into a state distribution. And what this gives is the distribution of states that I see if I draw a state action pair randomly from uh, the occupancy measure mu pi, and then I take a step forward according to the occupancy measure. So what this, uh, oh no, that's not what I wanted. So, uh, so this is going to be a probability distribution over states that is given by starting from the occupancy measure uh, p, uh, mu pi and then taking a step forward in the transition function, right? So I start from the state action occupancy measure and I take a step forward in this, uh, in this uh, probability distribution and this is going to give me the next state distribution. So what this recurrence relationship means is that uh, uh, the occupancy measure, occupancy measure itself can be written as a mixture of the initial state distribution and something that relates uh, the occupancy measure to itself. So, uh, so let me give you uh, some more intuition because I know that this is uh, like a bit of a foreign object. So, uh, so let me just mention the case uh, where uh, gamma is uh, gamma is one, which means that uh, there is no discounting, and we are considering the undiscounted sum of uh, returns. So in this case, this formula becomes very easy. Then it uh, essentially establishes that the state occupancy should be such that. If I start from the occupancy measure, and if I take a step forward in the transition function, then I arrive back to the very same distribution. So this means that uh, the distribution that I'm considering is sort of invariant under the state distribution. So, uh, or, or maybe yet another explanation is that if I consider some distribution over the over the state space uh, over the state uh, state action space. So this is some distribution, not necessarily an occupancy measure. And if I push this through the occupancy measure, then this is going to give me some other distribution. So so if I push it through the transition kernel, then this is going to be the state distribution that I get afterwards. Uh, and, uh, and, and an occupancy measure is essentially a special state action distribution that is invariant under this transformation, right? It's such that if I start from this distribution, take a step forward in the transition kernel, I'm gonna arrive back to the very same distribution. So it has this nice stationarity property. Right, so I think that, uh, that this, or there's some question maybe? All right, okay, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so this, so this limit of gamma equals one. This is, this is kind of weird, right? So, this is not exactly optimizing the discounted return. What this is optimizing is, uh, is the average infinite horizon return. Yes, but this is sort of like an easy, special case to think of when considering occupancy measures. Okay, there's another one. Yeah. So the. 
P matrix, is it the transition matrix under the policy pi or the transition matrix of the MDP? Right, so this, uh, so this P is, yeah, this is, this is a bit of quirky notation. Uh, uh, Mathieu has also used it in the morning. So this is an operator that maps, uh, so the P operator, the P transpose operator, it maps state action distributions to state distributions. So this maps from a vector over x times a to vectors over x. So this is, uh, so this is the transition function of the MDP, including the actions. And, uh, and similarly, the, the, the P operator, uh, if I write something like P times V, that is a state action uh, vector that evaluates the expectation of some function v over the next state given xa. Right, so p maps from x to xa and p transpose maps from x transpose, uh, for, from, from, from xa to x. Right, so this is just some convenient shorthand linear algebra notation that is, uh, that is sometimes useful. Right, but I, I suppose really the, the, the bottom line is that, uh, is, that this, uh, is that this occupancy measure satisfies this kind of very simple property. Uh, and it can actually be shown that, uh, that all occupancy measures satisfy this system of equations. And this property also goes the other way around as well. So every probability distribution that satisfies this property must be an occupancy measure. So, so mu is an occupancy measure if and only if it satisfies this system of equations. So what this, uh, again, uh, here this uh, E transpose mu notation is something that just uh, sums out the actions from mu. And this is an, uh, another simple linear operator that allows us to write the system of uh, equations in a very nice compact form. Right, so what we know uh, is that every mu satisfies uh, this system of equations. And this is uh, something that is incredibly useful because now I can just simply uh, turn my optimal control problem, my task of searching through uh, the space of occupancy measures into a simple linear optimization problem. So all of this uh, stuff that I've, ex uh, that I've explained establishes uh, the fact that uh, finding an optimal policy in a Markov decision process can be equivalently written as solving this linear optimization problem, right? So what am I looking for? I'm looking for a mu that uh, maximizes this dot product, right? I'm looking for a mu under which I have maximal expected reward. And the thing that I require my mu's to satisfy is that, well, I want my mu's to be <laughs> occupancy measures, but I know that all occupancy measures satisfy this system of equations, these constraints, so I only not need to solve this optimization problem. Maximize mu times r subject to this system of linear constraints. So you should uh, constraint is necessary, right? Is the question? Uh, sorry, say again? This uh, constraint that you have. Right. So you should that it's uh, um, necessary. Yes. Why is it and, and it is sufficient as well. So this is, this is what this theorem is saying, right? Oh, what okay. Right, so this is saying that uh, mu is an occupancy measure if and only if it satisfies this system. Right, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a very important point. Sorry, this is a follow-up on that question. Yeah. I assumed when you wrote this that mu is a probability measure, but is this saying that the right-hand side guarantees that it's a probability measure? Uh, yes, in fact, uh, the right-hand side guarantees that this is a probability measure because nu zero is guaranteed to be a probability measure, right? So. Uh, Right, okay, I guess the additional constraint that mu needs to satisfy is that it needs to be non-negative. Right? So that is, uh, that, is, that is what I'm not writing out here, that any non-negative mu that satisfies these constraints has to be an occupancy measure. And, uh, right, so if I, if, I, if I fix nu zero, which is a probability measure, right, then, and if I take any positive solution of this system of equations, then I see that I cannot rescale solutions because the nu zero fixes the scale, right? Because on the right-hand side, if that is one minus gamma times a probability distribution, 
and on the right hand side I have probability distribution, then I'm gonna have like a gamma times probability distribution uh, corresponding to P transpose here. All right, any further questions? Because I think that this is rather important to understand. Uh, if you wanna follow what, am I, what I'm about to say. Right, so, uh, so, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I don't know where to look, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to clarify maybe the intuition, why is it called a flow constraint? Is it, is it in and out flow, I guess, or? Right, yeah, so, so, so this is this is called a flow constraint, or sometimes called a Bauman flow constraint, even though Bauman did not invent this. Uh, and uh, I think that this is like a really recent terminology. But anyhow, it's called a flow constraint because you can you can think of uh, you can think of uh, this system of equations as a flow. So this is uh, the this is the mass that is in some probability, uh, sorry, in some state x, right? And this thing on the right hand side is whatever mass flows into this state. This is the mass that flows out from a state through the variety of actions, and this is the mass that flows into the state from the, from the initial state distribution and from the previous uh, state distribution as well. And this is some kind of like a mass preservation uh, equation. So if you think about the, if you think about deterministic transitions, then what this becomes is really the usual flow uh, constraint on a, on a graph. Uh, in PomDP program, there are another measures that is called the belief state. Right. Is that similar? Right. So 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 once you go to partial observability, things become a lot more complicated. So there, the belief state is. Uh, is a, it sort of determines a sequence of probability distributions, right, um, over over a state, and that is essentially like an infinite sequence, and uh, and it's uh, just getting more and more complex as you iterate uh, over over uh, state spaces, but uh, but here this is just one single probability distribution over a state uh, that measures the number of times that I'm going to be visiting future states. But indeed, belief states satisfy similar dynamic programming equations as well. But somehow that ends up being a lot more complicated. All right, good. So, so let's talk about this linear programming business. Uh, so, uh, so, well, now that you have agreed that in order to find an, opt a sol find an optimal policy, or find an optimal solution in my sequential decision-making problem, I know that I can simply look at this LP and I can find the occupancy measure that optimizes the, the expected reward. The question is, okay, how do I turn this into a policy, right? Because in reality, I want a policy. I want a way to make my decisions, right? I don't actually care about the joint distribution of states and actions if I'm trying to produce a solution to my problem. But I rather need a policy, and in, indeed a policy can be extracted extracted from the state action distribution, essentially just by uh, conditioning on the state and looking at the conditional distribution of actions given the state, right? So I can just extract this very easily. And another uh, very interesting fact that uh, I will return to in a minute is that uh, this uh, primal linear program has a so-called corresponding dual linear program as well. So those of you that know about the theory of linear programming know that uh, for every linear program there exists an equivalent dual linear program as well in which uh, there is an objective function that corresponds to, uh, to uh, constraints in the original uh, linear program and there is a set of constraints that corresponds to each variable in the original problem. So the dual linear program for Markov decision processes is stated uh, in these terms. And if you stare at this a little bit, you, you may realize that this looks an awful lot like the Bauman uh, equations, the Bauman optimality equations. Here what you have is uh, R plus gamma times PV, which can be thought of as a Q function. Uh, and uh, indeed it can be shown that the solution of this dual linear program is, uh, is uh, the optimal value function for the MDP. It's V star. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this aspect all that much, but it's sort of important for deriving some of the algorithms. That the dual LP, which takes this form, minimize the expected initial value, 
subject to the constraint that the value is greater than uh, the reward plus gamma times PV. So it's very easy to verify that V star satisfies this property. This inequality holds in every state action pair. And it's also easy to verify that I cannot push V further down. I cannot, uh, I cannot make the values of this V lower and still keep this constraint satisfied. So, so the optimal value function is still a solution for this. Yeah. Use the simplex method to solve the first LP. Can we expect the policy to be sparse as the solutions of the LP would be on the edge, uh, like on the uh, extreme points? Right, right, indeed, indeed, yes. So, uh, so solutions to the primal linear program are indeed sparse uh, uh, vectors, sparse distributions that are only supported on, well, the corners of uh, your domain, which correspond to deterministic policies. So as we know that there is a deterministic optimal policy in the original MDP, this immediately applies that there is a sparse solution for the primal LP as well. And these are, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the mu's uh, with non-zero entries are going to be exactly the constraints in which this is tightly satisfied. So many of these fundamental results from MDP theory can be understood from the, uh, from, from the perspective of linear programming as well. Yes, all very good points. All right, so, so let me just give you like a bit of a history lesson here. So, uh, so this linear program uh, framework has been, uh, I would say, first discovered in a special case by Mann in 1960, uh, and also De Link. I think that, uh, that this person is from Belgium, and Denardo is a, is a French mathematician in 1970 who stumbled upon the same formulation for, for, for optimal control, uh, and they have, slowly developed a general theory of these linear programs, uh, and they showed equivalence already to the Bauman optimality equations. Uh, and then in the operations literature, uh, Schweitzer and Seidman uh, proposed a method that really served as m the foundation of most reinforcement learning algorithms that have been developed in this, uh, in this framework. So in particular, they proposed a certain kind of relaxation of these linear programs to reduce the number of states and actions. And uh, interestingly, they were also the first to define the squared Bauman error, which is now the key component of many approximate dynamic programming algorithms, including DQNs. So I suppose uh, you should credit them when you're talking about the approximate dynamic programming. Uh, and their approach was uh, rediscovered and popularized by the Faria Sam Van Roy in 2003, uh, uh, which really brought this idea to the reinforcement learning and ADP community. And this inspired a bunch of uh, really nice follow-up work. So, uh, so the idea of all of this follow-up work is to, uh, is to take these linear programs and then to just feed them into a linear programming solver and then, uh, and then extract the solution and then try to somehow analyze the properties of the solution that they got. So, uh, so this is, of course, a very natural approach. This is many people's first idea. Well, this is an LP, right? I can just feed it into a standard solver. There are super fast, super efficient solvers for linear programs. So why not do this? Uh, of course, uh, one reason to not do this is that in a Markov decision process of practical interest, uh, typically we have way too many states in order to be able to rely on an LP solver. So there are just too many variables and too many constraints to deal with. And one line of work has focused on reducing the number of constraints and the number of variables in these LPs and make them more tractable. Uh, but of course, uh, the other problem, which is even more serious in reinforcement learning, is that, well, we don't actually know how to, uh, how to represent these LPs, right? So if you look at both of these LPs, the primal and the dual, you see that both of them involve expectations over the next state distribution, expectations with respect to P. Both the primal and the dual have these. So if I don't know my transition function, then I simply have no hope of solving these or approximately uh, uh, construct something that is digestible by a linear programming solver. So, so for, for, for this reason, uh, not many people have been trying to work on these approaches, uh, precisely because 
well, since I cannot represent my LPs, I cannot feed them into an LP solver, I need to find alternative approaches. And these alternative approaches is what I'm planning to talk about. So I suggest that maybe just go ahead in the interest of time and not do a break because I think I'm running a little bit behind schedule. So, uh, so I guess I'm just gonna continue if that's okay. If that's not too brutal, hopefully. Right, so this is, so this is what we're gonna be doing instead of solving the LPs. Actually, I have to say that uh, tomorrow uh, my student Germano is going to give you sort of like a practical hands-on lecture about these primal dual uh, uh, methods and LP-based methods. And the first approach that you're gonna be trying there is this LP-based approach. It's just uh, taking the LP, feeding it into a solver and see what you get and compare the solution that you get from, uh, with dynamic programming. And there you're gonna be seeing some interesting good and bad properties of these solutions that you get from LPs. Uh, but the main thing that I wanna talk about is, uh, uh, well, how to use this LP formulation as, as I said, some kind of like a, a guidance for developing reinforcement learning algorithms, right? So how do I uh, go around this idea of just solving the LPs directly? And how do I uh, figure out how to use this method that can work with samples, right? How do I address the challenges of reinforcement learning uses this as the starting point? In a similar way as reinforcement learning methods are based on the Bauman equations. So we're gonna be considering essentially two settings. One which uh, is uh, planning with a fully known transition function P and R, in which case we're gonna be able to do uh, uh, like very nice and easily implementable methods. And then I'm going to show you how to work with uh, generative models, which means that uh, what can I do if, I'm, if I have the ability to sample from the next state distribution given any X and A. And this is, this is, a, this is sort of a stylized planning model in which uh, many reinforcement algorithms are analyzed and developed first. Uh, and it's like sort of like easy to work with, easy to understand, easy to analyze. All right, so with that, let me start talking about primal dual methods. I guess we're gonna do a break when the Google Meet starts to die. <laughs> right, so, uh, so I talked about these LPs, both the primal and the dual. The primal is an optimization in the space of views, and the dual is an optimization in the space of values. But there is a concept that uh, connects both of these which is uh, the so-called saddle point formulation. So maybe let me ask real quick, how many of you know here about uh, linear programming duality or Lagrangian duality? All right, okay, okay, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. So, uh, so, so then I don't need to spend too much time explaining what this is. Uh, so, so these primal and dual LPs they can be shown to be equivalent to solving this saddle point problem, where this function that you're looking at is the so-called Lagrangian of the optimization problem. So this Lagrangian is, uh, is a function that takes two inputs. Uh, it, uh, it is a function of the primal variables mu and the dual variables v. And it has uh, the property that the saddle point of this Lagrangian, which means that the min minimum with respect to v of the maximum with respect to mu of the Lagrangian is equivalent to a solution of either the primal or the dual LP. Now, uh, now the reason for this is that, uh, is that one thing that you can show, maybe I can write it here, is that, uh, sorry, I guess I need to work on this technology a little bit, so that uh, if I want to minimize, subject to mm, the constraints on V, then this can be written as the minimum over V and the maximum over mu of the Lagrangian. Precisely because this uh, Lagrangian 
I guess the main point that I want to make is, is that uh, if I maximize over non-negative mu's of the Lagrangian, then it is easy to see that uh, what I'm going to get is a function that takes value plus infinity if uh, v is not feasible. And it takes value 1 minus gamma nu 0 times v if v is feasible. Right, so, so this Lagrangian function has this special property uh, uh, that if uh, v is not a feasible point, then uh, mu can choose to go to infinity and set the value of this uh, function to plus infinity. So as a result, if I want to minimize the maximum of this function with respect to mu, then I am truly just minimizing the objective function on the feasible set. So this is the key idea of Lagrangian duality, which inspires this set of one tree formulation. So this property that I mentioned is easy to see if, I, if you observe the structure of this uh, optimization problem. You see that if the constraints on, uh, on V are not satisfied, which means that, uh, that this thingy over here is positive, if the constraints are not satisfied, this R plus gamma PV minus EV is positive. So in this case, mu can choose value plus infinity and just simply run the value of this Lagrangian off to plus infinity and make uh, V uh, suffer uh, plus infinity loss. So essentially what I need to uh, do now and what uh, and the algorithmic framework that this observation inspires is the following. I'm just going to look at this Lagrangian function, which is a function of the primal and the dual variables, and I'm going to try to find its setup point by treating, as a, treating it as a two-player game, right? I'm going to define two players, one that controls mu, one that controls v. Mu wants to uh, maximize the value of this function, and v wants to minimize the value of this function, and we want to make sure that you're following uh, sort of game dynamics in a way that, uh, uh, that you're converging to a set of end problem. Yeah. Is EV in the dual LP the expectation of our value under our current policy? Right, so, so this E operator, I guess I should have put the definition on here. So this E operator, uh, if I transpose it, then it turns a state action distribution into a state distribution by summing out the actions. And uh, the corresponding uh, operator, and the adjoint of this operator, it turns a state action function, or sorry, it turns a state function into a state action function by repeating its entries for all of the actions. Right? So that's what that notation means. Right? So this E operator is something that takes an X dimensional vector as input and it returns an XA, XA dimensional vector as output such that uh, the, the entries of the input vector are repeated for all of the actions on the output. So, I mean, I should have written this uh, as uh, this constraint holding for, for all actions individually. What this means is really just that. All right, okay, so, so, so let's try to make this uh, algorithmic recipe a little bit more precise. So the idea uh, that we're gonna be following uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to try to give you like a little bit of a cookbook for developing primal dual algorithms here. Uh, so the idea is going to be uh, the following. We're going to figure out what optimization method to use to find approximate settle points of the Lagrangian, right? So we're going to be using this kind of primal dual uh, uh, gradient descent idea to converge somewhere near the settle point of the, of the Lagrangian. Uh, once we ran this primal dual algorithm, we need, to, we need to think of how we want to extract our policy from the resulting approximate solution. And then finally, we need to understand uh, when this policy is going to be good enough for our needs. We need to analyze the solution that we get. So we need to decide about how to optimize. We need to uh, decide about how to turn the solution into a policy. And then we need to understand the suboptimality of our solution. Um, is there some reason why the settle point problem is easier to solve than just the, 
the linear program itself? Right. So, so we're going to see that uh, for saddle point problems, we can develop algorithms that can work with uh, uh, that can work with samples from the transition function, right? And these are going to be stochastic gradient descent style methods for the primal and the dual players, as opposed to just an LP solver uh, that can actually deal with randomness or stochastic uh, samples, right? So that is that is really the the main reason for us to do this one. Yeah, maybe I should have clarified that. All right, so let's start cooking. So, uh, so of course, the idea, as I said, is to treat this problem as a, as a two-player game and try to uh, run learning dynamics for both of the agents in a way that we hope that we're going to converge to a set of point. So the precise algorithm that, uh, so this is, uh, this is essentially just gradient descent for the primal and the dual players. Uh, with some extra twist that I'm going to explain in a second. So, uh, so uh, we are going to initialize both sets of variables, uh, our mu variables and our v variables, and we're gonna perform a sequence of updates on both of those. Let me first talk about the dual update because that's easy to, uh, to comprehend. So we're gonna be on, uh, updating our value functions, our, our, our v's, our dual variables, by gradient descent, right? So this player wants to minimize the value of the Lagrangian, so it is going to move in the direction of the negative gradient of the Lagrangian, evaluated at the current point mu t v t, and the gradient is taken with respect to the value function. The expression of this is given uh, here at the bottom. Right, so this is uh, something that is, uh, that is easy to check. As for, the, as for the primal update, we do something that's a little bit fancier. So this is uh, something that is called exponentiated gradient ascent, and this is a version of gradient descent that is more suitable for working with um, with probability distributions for uh, for doing sort of uh, iterative optimization in the space of probability distributions. So here we are not adding the gradient to our uh, to our variables, but we are rather putting the gradient into the exponent, and this is. Uh, sometimes no, known as multiplicative weights or hedge or exponential weights algorithm. So this is something uh, that makes sense for, for probability distributions because you can see that uh, if this mu t is a probability distribution and it has non-negative entries, then of course after multiplying with an, with, with an exponential function, this is still going to be non-negative, right? So I don't need to project back to the domain. But it has many beautiful properties as well. So this algorithm is simple enough, right? You just do primal dual gradient descent, essentially, for both players. Uh, and uh, these kind of uh, primal dual uh, learning dynamics, uh, they typically come with guarantees on what is called the duality gap. So the duality gap, uh, it evaluates, in a certain sense, how close we are to the saddle point of the, of the, of the problem. So traditionally, uh, what uh, is uh, being used in this definition is uh, v plus equals v star and mu plus equals mu star. These are the so-called comparator points of uh, the duality gap. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, hi. Um, perhaps a naive question. Um, why are we outputting the average occupancy measure right. in the previous rather than the final iterate because yeah. that should be closer to the optimum. Oh, yeah, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, 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 the, so the reason for doing this is, is that uh, what these methods are trying to do is minimize their regrets from, uh, from their own perspective. And what we know is that uh, the final iterate of such uh, algorithms do not come with no regret guarantees. They do not come with specific guarantees and we need to do a certain kind of online to batch conversion. And these methods, yes, that's actually a very important point, that these methods do not output just their final iterate, but they output uh, the average of the iterates. So this is there to sort of stabilize the solutions, and, uh, and it is actually known to be required for these kind of like min-max games in the first place. Right, very good. All right, so these are, these are the solutions that we output, this mu out and v out. And the way to evaluate them is in terms of the duality gap. Uh, so like I said, the duality gap is uh, traditionally defined uh, with respect to v star and mu star. 
and this is something that sort of measures how far I am from the set of points. So it's easy to see that if uh, V out that uh, if the output is V star and uh, the output mu is mu star, then the duality gap, the, uh, the traditional definition thereof is zero, right? So in this sense, it measures how far I am from uh, the duality gap, or, or, or sorry, the, the set of point. So uh, in, uh, so it turns out that if you want to apply this uh, kind of methods for Markov decision processes, I need to introduce a little bit more flexibility into the definition of the duality gap, and I need to define the duality gap with respect to some comparator points, right? So I'm not trying to measure distance here from the setup point, but a kind of distance from some cleverly chosen comparator points. And uh, turns out that uh, this duality gap, uh, this quantity against the comparator mu plus v plus, uh, can be uh, written as, uh, as a very convenient form. So I'm not going to do this entire derivation. Uh, I'm just going to uh, show you that, uh, that the duality gap can be essentially rewritten as the sum of the regret of uh, the max player and the regret of the min player. So the duality gap is a quantity, right, that uh, after some minor uh, mathematical gymnastics can be rewritten as essentially the optimization error of the first player and the optimization error of the second player their regrets against comparator v pi. So what this, what this means, what regret means in this case is essentially measuring the extent to which, uh, for, so for example, this, this regret term on the right measures the extent to which the VT player, the player picking the VTs, regrets not having picked V plus during the entire optimization process. How much additional loss did it suffer not having known V plus since the beginning of the decision making process. And, and gradient descent and, and exponentiated gradient descent can guarantee that these quantities are going to be growing slowly and actually when divided by T, they are going to be going to zero at appropriate rates. So this is, uh, so this is the type of guarantee that these, uh, that these methods are going to give us. Right, so this is, this is about the optimization and the type of guarantees that we have on optimization algorithms. Uh, now the next question is, how do I extract a policy from my solution? And the natural idea there is to simply take the output occupancy measure, mu out, and then uh, simply uh, uh, calculate the conditional distribution of actions in each of the states, thus converting the occupancy measure or the approximate occupancy measure into a policy. So this, this, is, this is something that works as long as the den denominator is positive for each state x. Otherwise, if this is not true, then uh, it's sort of tricky to extract a solution. So this is one downside of this like, whole linear programming framework in the first place. Uh, uh, and if I do this, then I can show also that, uh, that the, the policy that I output is some mixture of all the policies that I've calculated over time with some coefficients that are sort of like very difficult to calculate. It's given by, it's given by some complicated calculation. This is not like a very practical way of representing this policy. So, so let, me, let, me, let me show you how uh, to put all of these pieces together and how to analyze the solution. I think that this is like one of like the most satisfying results uh, that has been done in the domain of this primal dual methods. So, the, the, the problem that you face when you try to analyze this method, and, uh, and uh, I have, uh, and many people have tried to face this problem, so all of these papers that I'm listing here on the top, uh, uh, this is a very nice paper by Meng Di Wang, some follow-up uh, with uh, her student, and uh, Chin Nang Cheng, and also with my student, Joan Bas, we've, we've been trying to work with such methods, and we've all faced this problem. Uh, that the quality of the final policy that uh, this procedure outputs is sort of hard to connect with the duality gap, right? So what I have is a guarantee on the duality gap. This is directly controlled by the sound of regrets. The big question is, how do I 
translate this guarantee into a bound and a quantity that I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is how suboptimal my policy is, right? How far am I from the optimal policy? The duality gap doesn't tell me anything about this, or at least not so far. People have been trying to connect this, coming up with like more and more complicated methods, and uh, and uh, until uh, until this really brilliant paper by Chinang Cheng uh, came out in 2020. Uh, this is an AI Stats 2020 paper. Uh, whose idea was the following. It's, it's, it's really mind-blowing. Hope you're, hope you're gonna find this satisfying because I'm gonna show you the proof. So uh, what they showed is uh, that if I choose the comparator for mu as mu star, and if I choose the comparator for v as v pi out, notice that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this comparator point is not v star, most importantly. So this is not the traditional comparator that is chosen for traditional uh, purposes of min-max optimization. So I pick v pi, uh, sorry, v plus the comparator for the v player is v pi out. Then I can show an exact relationship between the duality <coughs> gap. So this is the duality gap. I can show that this is exactly the gap between the expected reward of my policy and the expected reward of the optimal policy. So this is the quantity that I'm interested in. So what they show is that there is a direct relationship between these objects, and in particular what, uh, what they show is that uh, this first term is exactly equal to mu star times r, and this second term is equal to mu pi out times r. And this, and this second half is quite smart. So let me show you the proof, because I really like it. So, uh, so the first part is relatively easy. Just consider the Lagrangian evaluated at mu uh, star and v out. Uh, so by plugging in the definition, I get this, right? So this is just the definition. If I reorder the terms a little bit, so I keep mu star r first, and then I uh, move this uh, p v out, or sorry, I guess this uh, gamma p multiplier from one end of the dot product to the other, and I do the same with this E. Then I arrive to this expression, right? So this is gamma P uh, transpose mu uh, times E transpose uh, mu star, right? So I just moved these multipliers uh, to the other side, and all of this is multiplied by V out. Right, and then, then I look at this formula, right? So what do I notice? So I know that mu star is an occupancy measure, right? So it satisfies the constraints in the linear program, right? So as a result, this whole thing is just zero, right? Because mu star is an occupancy measure. So that, that term just goes away. It satisfies the constraints, which means that it is zero by the feasibility of mu star. So this was sort of the, the easy bit. The other one, which required a touch of genius, uh, is to evaluate uh, the Lagrangian at mu out and v pi out. V pi out is not v out, right? It's the value, it's the value function of the policy that I output at the end of the day. So if I plug in, again, just the definition, then I see that I'm gonna have mu out plus this, right? So this is r plus gamma p v out minus e v p out. Uh, and if I make the additional observation uh, that uh, mu out times E V pi out is equal to mu out times Q pi out. Right, so this is, this is something that can be shown in just like one line of calculation that I'm not going to show you. But uh, then this implies that I can replace this e v, up, v pi out by q pi out. And then what do we notice? Well, we notice that this entire thing is zero, right? Because, because of the Bauman equations, right? Because uh, the Bauman equations are satisfied, which says that uh, q pi out equals r plus gamma p v pi 
out, right? So these are the Bauman equations for the discounted uh, Markov decision process for policy pi out. And as such, this whole term becomes zero, right? It's just the left-hand side of the, uh, of the Bauman equations minus the right-hand side of the Bauman equations. So this whole thing goes to zero, and all I'm left with is this term, right? Okay, so uh, I guess enough of these red ink, I suppose. So then what can be shown is that this entire first term is zero because of the Bauman equations, because of my clever choice of comparator. And the second term is really just uh, the average award of my optimal policy, right? So just the, the, the value function of the output policy evaluated at the initial state distribution, which is exactly what I want to maximize, right? So this is, this is what shows, this is what concludes this proof that shows uh, that the duality gap evaluated at this very uh, curiously chosen comparator point exactly equals the suboptimality gap of the policy that I achieve at the end of the day. All right, so let me show you then what sort of guarantees one can derive from this. So, uh, so if we run uh, iterative algorithms for both the primal and the dual players, for example, the scheme that I showed you before, exponential weights for the max player and gradient descent for the min player. And let's say that these methods have regret bounded by R, mu, and RV, respectively. Then what I can show using the, the, the previous calculation is that the suboptimality of the policy that I output is simply upper bounded by the regret of the mu player plus the regret of the V player divided by T. Right, so this is just putting the two previous results together. And this is, this is really just, well, just follows from this one line calculation at this point. So, uh, so yes, this, this has been done by Cheng et al. And also in another very nice paper by, uh, by Jane and Sitford. Uh, so if you apply uh, specific regret minimization algorithms in this framework, uh, then one guarantee that you can derive from this uh, for example, if you know the exact transition function p and the exact reward function r, then it means that oh yeah, okay, sorry. So then it means that uh, you can run this algorithm exactly. So I need to go back quite a bit. Right. So, so here, right in this primal dual mirror descent uh, method that I've shown. Uh, I've said that uh, both of the players are going to be using the exact gradients which require evaluating uh, the transition function and uh, the reward function without errors. So if, I, if I'm able to do this, right, that means that I'm in the problem of, uh, of uh, that I'm in the setting of planning in a Markov decision process. So then I can implement this algorithm exactly without errors and without noise in the gradients. And if I do that, then I know that both players are going to have regret that is bounded by square root of t, and um, and I'm going to have uh, a suboptimal uh, an, an epsilon optimal policy after a given number of iterations. Uh, in particular, after one over epsilon squared iterations, I'm going to find an epsilon optimal policy. So why is that? So that is because the regrets. Uh, I guess, sorry, this is like the regret divided by t for both players. Uh, the regrets uh, over t, they go to zero at the rate of one over square root of t, right? And as a result, uh, uh, there is going to be one time in which uh, the errors are going to go below epsilon, and this t epsilon is the first time such that uh, the regrets go under that epsilon, and if you work through the math, then you're gonna see that after one over epsilon squared times x squared a, uh, times you are going to find an epsilon optimal policy with this scheme. So now, of course, uh, uh, you can you can tell me that this result is not particularly great. So this is like not like a real competitor for dynamic programming, because uh, because uh, you know in this scenario when I know p and I know r, I might as well just do dynamic programming. I might as well just do value iteration, and I can converge linearly to an optimal solution. So this is. Uh, so this is not such a great and uh, an attractive result, but this uh, but this method really starts to shine if you allow it to use uh, 
stochastic gradients, right? If you start considering the problem of planning with a generative model. Because in that case, you can build stochastic estimators of the gradient, and this is something that you're gonna be doing in the lab session tomorrow, uh, which is to take the gradient of the Lagrangian with respect to V. Uh, yeah, I guess some of this notation is like a little bit scrambled, but I think uh, it's sort of understandable. That, uh, uh, right, so this is the gradient with respect to mu. So if I take the gradient with respect to mu, which takes this form, I can simply uh, find a stochastic estimator uh, of this, uh, an unbiased estimator of this, by simply replacing this p, this transition function, with uh, a simple sa uh, uh, sample transitions. All right. So in particular, what, uh, what I can do is that uh, for all x and a, I can generate a next sample, and I can set p hat t uh, of x, I guess x prime xa, as simply the indicator that the sample that I draw was x prime. This is an unbiased estimator of uh, of the transition function in this uh, state action next state triple, and I can just simply plug this into my estimator, and this is going to give me an unbiased estimator of uh, the gradient. So this is the power of this method, that it is very, very easily adapted to uh, stochastic updates and stochastic gradients. And similar tricks can be done to come up with, uh, with, uh, with stochastic estimators for the gradient of the V player as well. And, uh, and uh, what you can show, perhaps surprisingly, is that this algorithm, uh, if you use primal dual gradient descent uh, with, uh, with these estimators in this stochastic setting, again, with appropriate modifications to the notation, uh, it satisfies the exact same guarantee as what I got for, uh, for, the, for the full information version of the same problem. So uh, in particular, I'm going to find an epsilon optimal policy after one over epsilon squared samples and the number of necessary samples it also scales with uh, with the number of states and actions uh, in a relatively reasonable way but what is notable notable about this that having developed all this like theory ahead of time proving this result is basically immediate right so we just put together the regret bounds for the primal and the dual players we get this uh, guarantee which is uh, which is close to being optimal for this specific setting Right, so, uh, so in the remaining little time that I have, let me just say a few words about how to extend all of this to linear function approximation. Uh, I'm not going to have like really any time for this, so maybe I'm just going to give a shout out to my student who's been working on a lot on this. Uh, yeah, she's falling asleep right now, but... Um, but uh, <laughs> no, she's seen this a million times, so that's, uh, so that's NECA. And, uh, and this is uh, largely based on, on her work. So the... The problem with these, uh, with these uh, well, cursed uh, LPs is that uh, they, uh, they are really just way too high dimensional. You have way too many primal variables and way too many dual variables, way too many constraints for this method to be applicable to, uh, to large scale reinforcement learning scenarios. So, uh, so it's unclear at the moment, uh, or, or well, it used to be a big question how to introduce function approximation in this scenario, how to uh, uh, introduce Q functions and how to use linear parametrizations for these Q functions in a reasonable way. Uh, so after uh, like quite a bit of research, uh, and some of this was, uh, was done uh, by my postdoc, Kira Pike Burke, and, uh, and John Bass, my student, uh, we have managed to come up with a sort of relaxed version of the LPs that have a Q function in there, in particularly the dual. Uh, so if you look at the primal LP, this really corresponds to some kind of like a constraint splitting and projection in the in the primal. But what's important about this is that this uh, is that this object here can be thought of as a linearly parametrized Q function, and this allows the use of linear function approximation in the linear program scenario. 
and, and it can be shown that the optimal solutions of these LPs are going to be the, uh, the true optimal policies under some uh, standard uh, but restrictive conditions on the, on the Markov decision process. And uh, what's most interesting from the perspective of this talk uh, is that uh, we can uh, turn this into a similar set of point problem as before by introducing the Lagrangian, by, introducing, by folding the, the primal and the dual LPs in the two, and finding minimax points, set of points of this, uh, of this uh, little optimization problem. So, uh, so here the solution uh, that one can think of is just, again, use primal dual gradient descent on all of these new variables that you have, uh, that you have introduced. Uh, we have introduced some variables D, for which we're going to be doing some kind of uh, gradient descent updates. We have introduced these parameters theta, for which we're going to be doing gradient descent, and so on. Uh, and then conclude all of this calculation, which is uh, which can be quite uh, involved, by outputting the average of the d variables that we calculate. Right. So, uh, so this is. Uh, I know that you're like going rather fast here, and I don't really have like too much time to explain the details. Uh, but it can be shown that again we can extract the policy from this solution d out uh, using uh, the same procedure as before by just calculating the conditional distribution of the actions given states. Uh, uh, and then it can be shown that this, uh, that this trick by Chang et al. It continues to work and we do get some kind of like an optimality guarantee for the resulting policy. But the problem is that, uh, that, this, uh, that this variable d pi out is still a very high dimensional variable and this, is not, uh, this does not result in an algorithm that you can, uh, that you can run in reality. Uh, the problem is that the policy that we get from all of this is going to be some kind of like a weird weighted mixture of policies that we calculate, and these are just somehow like not practical at all at the end of the day. So, uh, so at this feel at, at this moment, you may feel that you know I just can't do it all of this like primal dual uh, uh, methods. This is not something that uh, gives you practical algorithms, uh, but turns out, and this is a problem that we've been working a, uh, a lot on with NECA. Uh, is that you can sort of adapt all of this primal dual framework. Uh, again, there are many, many peculiarity, peculiarities uh, of, this, of this algorithm that I don't have time to get into. But the most important thing that I want to highlight here is that, uh, is that uh, the policies that are used by this method are all softmax policies, right? And the policy that is returned by this primal dual procedure, which is some kind of like complicated version of the same method uh, with some bells and whistles. So the, so the output produced by this method is simply one of these policies that I have just calculated. And this is something that comes from another online to batch conversion. So importantly, the, the output of this procedure has a simple and nice soft match representation. Running the algorithm itself can be rather complicated. It may require full loops over a very, very large part of the state action space. But once I've run my algorithm, I can return a very simple policy right? without having to rely on converting an occupancy measure into a policy. So somehow this method allows us to not really work in the space of occupancy measures and sort of work more directly in the space of policies. So I'm going to skip all these uh, beautiful technical parts and maybe I'm just going to flash this result. Uh, so this gives us sort of a way uh, of uh, producing an epsilon optimal policy in polynomial number of samples in infinite horizon uh, MPPs under linear function approximation, which is uh, still a problem that uh, is very difficult for other theoretically grounded methods that are computationally efficient. So this is, a, I think, a very interesting result. So okay, I'm going to skip over all of this to try to finish on time. So, uh, so let me just say a few words about future directions. So, so uh, all of this stuff that I told you about was uh, limited to the setting of planning, uh, either with full knowledge about the transition function and the rewards, or generative access to, uh, to the same objects. Uh, and, uh, and I would say that this is true of uh, essentially all uh, 
currently available pr primal dual methods for reinforcement learning. Uh, currently, these methods are limited to this kind of uh, relatively restricted setting. Uh, uh, there has been some work on trying to derive reinforcement learning methods from it. So, for example, we have a follow-up paper to our work with, uh, with NECA that was done uh, with my student Germano and Matteo uh, and, and, and NECA, um, where we did essentially the same recipe for offline reinforcement learning that is somehow like a little bit more satisfying algorithm. Uh, so we can find that thing on archive. Uh, but really the big question is, okay, how do we derive practical, like really uh, actually implementable and, and, and practically applicable reinforcement learning methods from this framework. So right now there's no final answer to this, but I will say that there are several methods that have been derived from this linear programming framework that I did not mention today. Gary has already mentioned uh, relative entropy policy search uh, by, um, by Jan Peters et al. And I think uh, Mathieu already ma uh, also mentioned this. We had a follow-up uh, on this uh, called logistic queue learning with my student Joan Bass, and also another similar method uh, called convex queue learning by Sean Mine and, and co-authors. So, so there had been some progress in this direction, extending LP-based and primal dual style methods into the reinforcement learning scenario. And I would say that, uh, that this is probably a very good moment to start thinking about these problems. It's a very promising area with a lot of open problems uh, that, uh, that, uh, that await to be solved. And hopefully all of these methods can eventually become like a little bit more practical and a little bit more accessible. And I hope that uh, you found this introduction to be useful and that you're gonna be able to work on some of these problems in the future. All right, so now let's get to some reward. What were the probabilistic qualifiers for those uh, sample complexity results on the stochastic uh, versions of these? Uh, so, yeah, so these, these bands hold an expectations. Expectation, that's what you mean. Uh, so somehow this, uh, this method is, uh, is inherently random, and uh, it looks very hard to, uh, to provide high probability guarantees here because of this random policy that we output, right? So for such randomized output policies, it's hard to provide high probability guarantees. So that's a, that's a nice open question, but uh, we, are, we, were, we, were, we were like thinking about one million things to avoid doing this, but, uh, but this is the best thing that we could come up with, but we are very happy with it that we didn't need to do the, the, the occupancy measure stuff. Okay, so maybe, maybe one more. Uh, so the Bajakov theorem, uh, you showed that had an uh, equality. Right. And if we take the regret bounds to be lower bounds, uh, is there work to show results on the limitations of this approach? Right, yeah. So, so regret lower bounds are typically uh, specially constructed counterexamples. And those counterexamples cannot be necessarily embedded in this uh, reinforcement learning scenario. Like the way to prove regret lower bounds, the way to show that, well, this and this learning problem is harder than this and this, right, is typically to, con uh, to construct like a very peculiar hard case that is not necessarily embeddable into this setting. So those, right. those hard cases are typically like unstructured and... Uh, so uh, they're mainly examples that we're not interested in, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. So these uh, uh, examples that are handcrafted, they're examples that we're not interested in, is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm wondering if yeah. there's anything that would rule out hope in any special case, or? Right, yeah, so that's a, that actually leads to like several good points, including like lower bounds on the, the best achievable complexity by such min-max based methods. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good thing to look into, but uh, I, would, I would find it really hard to like think of lower bounds in this scenario. Let's let's do that at coffee, all right? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, everyone.